evening. In this program, we're going to talk once again about the giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn. We've learned so much in the last few years. Chris Linsholt, as always. We certainly have, and we've got a particularly exciting new mission. ESA, the European Space Agency, has decided its next big thing in space is going to be a mission called JUICE, that's going to go to Jupiter and explore its moons. And with us, we've got two of the people who made JUICE happen, Michelle Doherty from Imperial College London, and my colleague Lee Fletcher from Oxford. So, congratulations on being selected. Thank you very uh, much. But, Michelle, what's JUICE going to do? Okay, um, as you said, it was recently chosen, and so the plan now is we'll go into a study phase. We will be launched in 2022. It will take eight years to get there, and so reach the Jupiter system in 2030, and then we'll spend at least three and a, three and a half years within the system and orbiting around the moons. Well, you may still be in the sky at night then. I sadly won't. Well, 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 that remains to be seen. <laughs> which which means do you go to first? We, we will fly past Europa first. We'll have two flybys of Europa. We will then have a Callisto phase, which is going to be interesting, not only because we're going to be looking at Callisto, but also because we're going to be coming out of the equatorial plane. And so that's going to allow us to get into regions we just haven't seen before. And then we will move to Ganymede, and we'll spend nine months orbiting around Ganymede, and we will end the mission by crashing on the surface. So this is the first time a probe will have orbited a moon of one of the giant planets. Lee, why are the moons so important? That's right, so the Galilean moons in particular, each one has a very different, unique environment that uh, in its own right would be worth studying. But the point of JUICE, or the idea behind the mission, is to compare the conditions that we find on, the, on three of those moons, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. Now, all, most of the moons of the outer solar system are made of ice, and that's simply because of the very, very cold temperatures of the outer solar system, water exists in its frozen form, and so it makes up the large proportion of these moons. But the tantalizing thing about these particular three moons is that there is a source of energy that causes the ice to melt to become liquid water. And we believe that a liquid ocean exists beneath the surface of these three icy moons. And that has huge implications for the potential for these moons to be habitable. That's not that they do support life right now, mm -hmm. but it's that there is the chance or the potential for life to, to exist on these, these icy worlds. So Michelle, what's the source of energy that keeps some of the, the ice liquid? In the, in the environment around Jupiter, most of the energy comes from the frost rotation of Jupiter. But as far as the energy sources of the interior of the moons is concerned, we think they're still hot in the interior because of the tidal forces between Jupiter and the moon. So in other words, as they go around Jupiter, they push and pull, yes. and it's, it's yes. very powerful gravity. Yes, yeah. yes. And so that's what allows the interior of the moons to still be warm. But there are two other things that you need if you're going to look for life. You need there to be complex organic compounds, and you also need the environment to be stable over quite a long period of time. So you need water, mm -hmm. you need heat, you need stability, and you need chemical. Would it be ordinary water, I mean, it's true, right, ours? We think it is, yes. We also think that it's... Um, Conductivity, the amount of salt that we have in the water, is probably similar to ours. But we're only postulating from the observations that we got from the Galileo spacecraft. What we really need to do is get a spacecraft that will orbit around Ganymede, make observations on the surface, but also be able to understand what's underneath. So, so all of these four ingredients that Michelle was just talking about, JUICE will be able to study and to look for, and so we'll finally be able to answer some of these questions that Galileo, back in the 1990s through to 2003, they, they left open, and uh, planetary scientists ever since have been trying to resolve some of these questions. Michelle, let's go back to Europa. Mm -hmm. You talked about recent activity on the surface, but how recent are we talking about? Is this something that's happening right now no. on the surface? No. What, what people have done is they've gone back to the Galileo observations and they've compared them to observations that we have of the Greenland ice shelf. And looking at those, you could almost convince yourself that you were looking at the same thing. Okay, and the Greenland ice shelf changes over, what, tens of thousands of years, or thousands of years. So we should expect that sort of time scale on, on That's Europe. That's right. One of the interesting things about these, these regions of um, potentially recent activity, we say recent on a geologic time scale, mm -hmm. so long periods of time, is that they may be regions of the crust which are actually thinner 
than elsewhere, where you've got an exchange of, say, energy, for example, from the interior of this moon up towards the uh, the icy surface. And so these fractured, chaotic terrains mm -hmm. are actually really tantalising targets for future spacecraft like like Juice, especially if it has the capabilities to probe deep through and beneath that icy crust. If we go for the thinner regions, we might get access to that, that icy ocean beneath. Then we come now to, to Ganymede, the largest satellite of the entire solar system. That's right. And we actually see detail on them. Again, the juice is going to go into orbit, right? That's right. We thought long and hard about whether we wanted to orbit around Europa or uh, orbit around Ganymede. And in fact, Ganymede is more interesting, I think. In <laughs> um, as we know, it's the largest moon in the solar system. Yes. It also is the only moon in the solar system that has an internal planetary field. It's got a dynamo field inside. Just like the Earth has. Just like the Earth has. And in addition to that, it also has a magnetic field that's induced by currents that are flowing in the ocean un underneath. And so there's a complex mix of all these different fields that we need to try and understand. And you care because they're telling you about the interior. Yes. Right. That's, yes. that's the point here. Yes. So what do the surfaces of these uh, two outer moons look like? Well, as you move from the largest moon, Ganymede, out to Callisto. Callisto has a very ancient and battered mm -hmm. terrain. We think it's a, a remnant of the very earliest bombardments that took place within the solar system. So this, if you like, is a, is a much more inactive moon, some would say a dead moon, that isn't having resurfacing processes taking place. Whereas on Ganymede, there's a, there's a higher probability that we might see the evidence that activity has occurred mm -hmm. in, in geologically recent history. In fact, if you, if you have um, ground-based observers that are able to resolve contrasts on, uh, across uh, Ganymede, and there's a large um, ancient dark terrain called Galileo Regio, which is visible in some of the best amateur images that we see, so especially when when Juice uh, finally gets to Jupiter, we'll have a huge amateur community mm -hmm. there along with us, observing the same features as the oh. spacecraft is seeing from up close and personal, so I think that's going to be one to watch. Is this then a common way for moons in the solar system to be? I mean, all three you've talked about, they're icy, they have underground oceans, that must be telling us something about what's likely in the solar system. Yes, well, we think so. I mean, that's one of the reasons that we want Juice to go to yeah, the, it's an un unanswered to question. Right the system. Uh, what we want to try and do with the three moons we're going to focus on at Jupiter is get an understanding about why they're different, try and understand what the heat source is. We think we know what the heat source is, but why is it having a different effect on all three of the moons? Um, but also really try and understand whether there are environments in our solar system where the conditions are there so that life might be able to form. Because um, if we can understand that at Ganymede, if we go into orbit around Ganymede and spend a lot of time looking at it, it will allow us to then describe how we think some of the bodies outside of our solar system might have formed, and some of the extrasolar work that has been done as well. Yeah, after all, if you can find planets in the Goldilocks zone around their star, not too hot and not too cold, Absolutely. they may have icy moons as well. well and this, this is a, a revisiting of that Goldilocks hypothesis, the idea that you have um, temperatures that are just right here on planet Earth for life to have existed. Mm -hmm. But what we're saying is that these icy moons of the solar system, which traditionally you don't think of as being part of, because they're far the too cold, cold. They're far, <laughs> too, way cold, too, far, far too distant, That's right, yeah. but actually they might have these four ingredients, the mm -hmm. stability with time, the energy source that's required, and the supply of uh, materials in a liquid water environment. It'd be nice to have some toothed fish wandering around <laughs> as well. Not I'm not sure if we can actually promise that's going to happen next. <laughs> not really, not yet. Well, we've talked a great deal about Jupiter. On now to Saturn, this family of moons. Yes, as we know, Cassini is orbiting around Saturn. And two of the moons in particular are very interesting, partly because we can compare them to the moons of Jupiter, and that is Enceladus and Titan. We know that both of those moons have got bodies of liquid underneath the surface. And so by learning more about Titan and Enceladus now at Saturn, we can then feed that information to what we're going to learn with Juice at Jupiter. Well, shall we start with Enceladus? Because I think that's the icy moon, so mm -hmm. that seems closer to the, the Jovian examples. But Enceladus is a weird place. To me, 
The fountains of Enceladus are the weirdest things in the entire solar system. Mm. I think they are too, but it's weird in a fascinating sort of way. But it's very clear that there is an energy source at Enceladus that is keeping the interior heated. We know that the water ice has become liquid, and we know that because water vapor is escaping out from the South Pole. And we see amazing pictures of these Gorgeous streamers, pictures. and yes. you detect them with other instruments as well. We've flown through the plume. We've been able to measure the amount of organics and dust and water vapor in the plume. And the really interesting thing from my perspective is the amount of activity is changing over time. And so it's very clear that there are internal processes taking place which are changing from one week to the next. So is this a special time then now that we're able to view Enceladus with these these geysers happening or is this is this something that could have been happening over thousands and hundreds of thousands of years in the past? I think it must have been happening for a long period of time because mm. it's now very clear that Enceladus and its plumes is the source of the of the E-ring and we know that the E-ring has been in existence. And so this is one of the Saturn. outer of Saturn's rings. Right? Yes, it's one of the rings that you can't visually see. Well, we don't see anything like this in any of Jupiter's small moons. Why just Enceladus? Possible discoveries that we might make when we have Europa flybys with juice is maybe we will see something at Europa, but it's very clear that Enceladus is unique in the sense it's very small, has this internal heat source that we didn't expect to be there and it's spewing out a large amount of water vapor. Now one question I have is we know that water vapor is salty in some sense or it's got it's not just pure water That's right. I know that because yes. you've flown through it yes. very bravely. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, know if they would want to do it that. again I don't yeah. know uh, the closest flyby we had was 25 kilometers above the surface and it was very clear after it happened that the mission planners will not do it again <laughs> because the mag boom sticks off from the side of the spacecraft and spacecraft moved a little bit more than they thought it would as we flew through the plume. So they don't want the spacecraft to tumble because so it's a really lofty ride yeah. on the way through. Yeah. I wonder why not. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, we, from this brave, plucky adventure through the Phantoms of Enceladus, it's like something out of sci fi. Yes, it is. Through yes. the Phantoms of Enceladus, it's fabulous. And we discovered that the water is salty, it has, has, has other material in there. And yes. People have suggested that that means it's got a, there, there's a rocky core. There might be a rocky core, we don't know. A lot of work is being done at the moment in trying to model the, what the interior actually looks like. But I think to be able to understand it best, we would need to go into orbit. And that's difficult to do because the gravitational field of Enceladus is so small, you need a huge amount of fuel to be able to get into orbit. And so we're going to have to make do with lots more flybys that we have of Enceladus by the Cassini spacecraft. Let's turn now to Titan, unlike any of the others. As an atmosphere, for example, and an interesting surface. Yes, we haven't really got to see the surface until very recently because the atmosphere is made up of ethane and methane. It's almost like a very smoggy place and you can't see through it. And so it's only been with some of the instruments on board Cassini that we've been able to see through the atmosphere and down onto the surface. And, you know, I think one of the initial disappointments with the Titan observations was the fact that we expected to see lots of liquid on the surface and we didn't yes. for years mm. and it was only very recently that the first signatures of a liquid some type of liquid on the surface was seen and we think that's due to the weather patterns that probably no rain had fallen for a long period of time and it was only after rain had fallen that we got to see and we do see surface. evolving weather through yes. the Cassini mission That's right. we've seen clouds come and go within certain latitudes on Titan and we know that there's something particularly special about the North Pole of Titan whereby there's large bodies of standing liquid of some variety some combination of methane and ethane and various hydrocarbons up there certainly not, not water certainly not, certainly water. not water and I think that one of the closest comparisons is like the liquid natural gas sort yes. of thing on the surface. Yes, it's, it's certainly a fascinating region and the first time I think in planetary exploration where we can really talk about one day exploring an ocean 
on a surface and sailing a boat on the surface of another moon. And you see, I mean, it what strikes me from some of the shots from Huygens, which is the probe that went through the atmosphere and landed mm -hmm. on the surface, you, as it went down, you could see what looked like river valleys yes. and channels, and you, yes. it's very easy landscape to read because it looked very mm -hmm. Earth-like to its right. yeah. but very cold, of course. That's yeah. right, yes. Mm. Now, we're talking about Titan because we were talking about uh, worlds with oceans beneath their surface. Yeah. So, the Jerry moons and so on. Now, is that the same sort of model that we have for Titan? Where's this, or is the liquid confined to the surface? And no, there have been some radar observations of Titan, which um, sh seem to imply that there is a liquid, there is a body of liquid underneath the surface. Um, we're hoping with the magnetic field instrument to be able to measure induced currents that are flowing in that ocean, but we can't really get close enough. Because Titan has an atmosphere and it's a dense one, because we've got the boom sticking off from the side of the spacecraft, the, the mission planners do, don't want to get us closer than about 950 kilometers, because as the atmosphere gets denser, the the spacecraft could begin to tumble if it goes into a very dense atmosphere. So we hope we will get some observations of induced currents, but we aren't sure we're going to be able to do it. And we want to keep the spacecraft alive until it goes into its polar orbits at the end of the mission. Well, we talked about some of Saturn's moons. Let's now talk about the ringed planet itself. There have been exciting times in, in Saturn recently. Back in 2010, Cassini saw this gigantic spike in the amount of lightning emission coming mm. from the planet, showing that there was a gigantic thunderstorm evolving. Now, this thunderstorm grew to be what we described as planetary in scale. It'd be like a single storm on Earth enveloping the entire of a latitude circle. So it was something absolutely amazing to watch, and Cassini was very lucky to be there to see it. That thunderstorm lasted from the end of 2010 through to the middle of 2011, when we thought things were starting to die down, the lightning strikes were dying away, and all the churning, bubbling, convective activity in the storm had seemed to subside and, and, and dissipate. But it's not over, and I can tell you that Cassini is still tracking the remnants of this particular storm. In particular, it had an effect on the atmosphere really, really high up that can only be seen at infrared wavelengths of light and the storm is really still raging up there. So it's infrared you're detecting heat usually, so this is energy that's been injected into the upper layers of the atmosphere, presumably. Absolutely. That's why you see it glowing like mm -hmm. this. If you were to, um, on Earth, uh, you fly in an aeroplane, you try to get very, very high up above all these storm cells, precisely to avoid all the sort of turbulence and bumping that are inherent with them. But on, on Saturn, we didn't really expect the same sort of things to be taking place. And actually, you have this huge um, region of hot, heated gas, many hundreds of kilometers higher up than those churning, bubbling storm clouds. And so it's telling you that the storm that's happening down at depth is having a huge effect mm. on the atmosphere, hundreds of kilometers higher up. And we've never seen that anywhere in the solar system before. So it's particularly exciting to be tracking this at the moment. And you're quite right, we're seeing it as heat energy emitted by the planet Saturn with Cassini's instruments. Why do you think the atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn are so different as they are? When you look at uh, Jupiter, you're seeing right down to the region where the clouds condense. Okay, you're seeing the fluffy white ammonia clouds and possibly the ammonium hydrogen sulfide clouds. The difference is on Saturn is that above those clouds there are haze particles. There are, the haze is in fact so thick that it reflects the light before the light gets down yes. to the typical clouds. So it's almost like smog. Mm -hmm. Exactly like smog. A bit like with Titan, for example. A bit like Titan you, smog. Yes. You can't see the surface because of all the smoggy, hazy stuff. Yeah. Saturn, you can't see the main cloud decks because of all the smoggy, okay. hazy stuff. That's how are they different? Why are they different? Why does Saturn have this smog and Jupiter not? Well, there's a difference in size, don't forget, between these, these two planets. And what that does is it means that the gravitational acceleration on the two planets is very different. The pull of gravity. The pull of gravity. Yes. So it literally means that all the cloud decks on Saturn are more spread out with altitude, whereas on Jupiter they're more localised and they're squashed mm -hmm. together. And that means that the amount of a particular material, say it's methane or ammonia or hydrogen sulphide, available to form a cloud is very different. And, for example, the thing that makes Jupiter have that red colour, we think has got something to do with phosphorus, 
when I'm sat on that phosphorus is all locked away mm -hmm. deep in the interior and isn't able to get up to cause the red coloration of the clouds. So the, it's basically it's the difference in size that causes such great big differences in the hazes and the chemistry that's at work within these atmospheres. So we've been talking about juice, of course you've got a lot of work to do before you get to launch. We so you'll have some time off between launch and getting to Jupiter, I'm sure. Really? So, so uh, what, 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 do you, what do you think, though, if I had to force you all to choose one really big question about either Jupiter or Saturn or the moons to answer, what, what would it be? What do you reckon, Pedro? I know what you're going to go for. You're going to say Enceladus, I, I presume. Yes, thousands of Enceladus, these fashion, these fascinate me. I want to know about the rings, because we haven't mentioned them, so I want to know how long-lived Saturn's rings are. I want to know about what, how long a day lasts on Saturn. Is we still don't know exactly what the rotation rate of Saturn is. Hang on, but you've got a probe orbit. I know, I know. Um, but because it's not a solid surface, and because there isn't something on the surface that we can follow around. No Greenwich Meridian spinning around. The, and the observations that we make in the magnetic field shows it's around about 10.7 hours. But if you're in the northern hemisphere, it's different to when you're in the southern hemisphere. And so that's why the end of mission, when we get really close in, that's going to answer that. It's a fundamental thing, because of course how fast Saturn rotates determines how we map features on Absolutely. Saturn. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we don't know <laughs> no, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't Fine. Well, you can save your embarrassment by discussing that. <laughs> okay. Okay. And I, think, I think the fundamental question I'd like to have answered is why is the great red spot the colour red? We don't know what the chemical is that causes it to be red in colour. Well, I hope that Juice will have the answer to that question. Well, we certainly learned a great deal from the probes and the there's much more to be learned. I suspect that in 10 years, we'll all have our ideas quite consistently. But for the moment, thank you all very much. Now to Selsey Beach, where Pete and Paul are going to tell us something to look forward to. Well, Pete, we've come down to this incredibly bleak beach <laughs> <It's a bit laughs> to talk about the things we can see in the night sky over the next coming months. And there are some interesting things, isn't there? Yeah, there are. There are sort of nice, gentle things which are very easy to see. I mean, if the clouds were out of the way <laughs> and it was a bit later at night after the sun had gone down, there, this is the season where you can see a phenomenon known as noctilucent clouds. Yeah. Have you ever seen noctilucent clouds? I do not, I haven't. And I know they can get very bright, very powerful. We well, haven't seen one. We ought to explain exactly what they are. Noctilucent clouds are basically really high altitude clouds, much, much higher than the normal clouds we've got up here. Now, in the summer months, if you're going through sort of from late May into early August, August, as the sun goes below the horizon, there's a period when the light from the sun can't illuminate these clouds, so these clouds will be completely dark. Yeah. If the sky is clear and you've got noctilucent clouds there, they're high enough to be able to reflect sunlight. Mm. So even though the sun is well below the horizon, these clouds are shining away at night, which is why they're called night shining clouds, that's what noctilucent means. Well, what I've seen of long road period exposures uh, these they can change as well it's quite dynamic. they are amazing i've seen loads of noctilucent clouds down here they basically look they sort of glow with an eerie electric blue glow to them that's the best yeah. way of describing them they can um they look like a sort of network a really fine detailed network of clouds now the way to look for them is to wait for the sun to go down and say an hour a couple of hours after sunset look in the northwest and if you can see some sort of glowy clouds down there keep an eye on them they could be noctilucent clouds okay. also in the morning a few hours before the sun comes up in the northeast that's where you may see them but if you get a really really bright display as we have had a few years back, they will actually persist all the way through the night. They're actually right on the edge of the twilight glow that you can see to the north. It's absolutely I'm beautiful. I have to hopefully you'll get to see some this season. Now, of course, another thing with noctilucent clouds is they're very, very photogenic. Oh, they and there are lots of beautiful photos out there, and there are lots of beautiful photos to see on our Flickr site. Yeah. Now, if you don't know the address of our Flickr site, then you can go on to bbc.co.uk forward slash sky at night, and the details are on there. And if you get any photographs of them this time round, and they could occur any time throughout the period from late May through to 
early August, then do send them in. Uh, coming up, we also have another interesting event on July the 15th. Ah, yes. And this is the occultation of Jupiter by the moon. Well, it's not visible everywhere. Though, no, that's it? right. This is actually uh, quite an interesting event. It's Jupiter will pass really close to the northern edge of the moon. Right down in the southeast is the best view. Now, as you move further up the country, then you start to see less and less of the moon covering Jupiter. Until when you're in the Midlands, it's what's known as a grazing occultation. Yeah, Jupiter will appear to just pass just over the top of and the moon. If you moon. catch it right, you can just catch Jupiter passing the, the sort of mountains and valleys on the edge of the moon. That will make a lovely shot. That would be fantastic. Yeah. And to, to see that, start observing from about half past two, BST onwards. I hope it's a lot warmer than it is now. We've got some lovely events. It can't be cloudy for all of them. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Hope we get something interesting. Definitely. Let's begin our news notes with Mars and that amazing probe. Opportunity has started moving again. Yes, it's had eight years on the surface of Mars, but for the last few weeks, as it does every Martian winter, it's it's been stationary because there isn't enough solar power in northern winter uh, to keep it moving, to, to give it enough power to drive its wheels. Uh, but it's now started moving again, and it's going to continue its journey uh, around the rim of Endeavour Crater, which is a much larger crater than it's been to before, and also the terrain there is much older. And that's why it's there, of course. It did this massive trek across the Martian surface to get to this point so that we could read off billions of years of Martian history. It's already done that. Just before it went into its winter shutdown, it found a place called Homesake, which had this bright material on the surface. It turned out to be gypsum, which we know was deposited in reasonably warm water. So this was a lake or a sea, probably quite a nice temperature to go swimming in, I imagine. Uh, but it, we know now know from studying Homesake that this was last underwater billions of years ago. So we're really getting to ancient Martian history. So what's Opportunity going to do next? Well, it's going to, in the long term, it's going to continue its exploration of the crater, working its way around the edge, probably too steep to go in at any point. Um, but its immediate objective is more of this gypsum that's nearby, so we can see if Homestake was unusual or whether we need to go somewhere else. And will how long it lasts? We still don't know. No, it's going to be on Mars because so. we come to, to Vesta, the brightest of the minor planets. That's right, and visited at the minute by the Dawn spacecraft, which has just been given a few extra months at Vesta uh, to finish exploring uh, this wonderful little world. And there's some fabulous uh, movies that have been put together. So these are computer animations, but with real data from Dawn. And they're pretty spectacular, Chris. They're showing you some amazing features. There's the grooves around Vesta. We're not entirely sure how they're created. It's something to do with it. It's very violent past. It's, it's clear from the shape of Vesta. It's got an enormous impact basin uh, near its south pole. We know that impact basin is, is relatively young, where in these, in these terms, relatively young means a, a couple of billion years. Uh, which in solar system terms it is young. Uh, and mapping the surface of Vesta, its, its southern hemisphere is very different to its northern hemisphere, is something that Dawn is going to do very well, and it, it's going to be there until August this year, before it moves on its way to Ceres. I think the most famous feature that Dawn's seen so far is the snowman, if you remember that. Oh, yeah, talked about that before. Well, this flyover is a flyover the middle of those craters that make up the snowman. It just gives you a real sense of, of the terrain of Vesta, and what it would be like to be wandering across the surface of this asteroid. It's quite spectacular. I love the try. <laughs> we have to finish news notes with at least one beautiful picture, I think. And my favourite this month is from the European Southern Observatory at La Silla in Chile with their 2.2 uh, metre telescope, this image of Centaurus A, uh, a nearby active galaxy. You can see the dust disk warped in the centre there, and then the galaxy extending out, and it's just an absolutely stunning image. I, th I think Centaurus A is one of the most fascinating galaxies in our, in our local neighbourhood. It's about 13 million light years away. It's got a massive black hole in its centre with, with jets coming out of it, and, and in this image, just, just sort of towards the top left, you can see some filaments of gas which are linked to those jets of material that we see normally in, in X-rays and radio waves. Uh, and we know that Centaurus A in the past few billion years has swallowed up another galaxy. It's been a, a cannibal, essentially. And that's what some of this warped disk in the centre of it is, with this, the remains of this, this a smaller galaxy that got swallowed up. Can you can't see it from here. Indeed. Yeah. Well, yes, Southern Hemisphere, but we can enjoy the image, and I'm certainly going to do that. And here it is. There's so much for learning. Chris and Chris, thank you very much.
Well, next month, we'll talk about the inner solar system and, of course, the transit of Venus. Until then, good night.